Hello, I'm Bill Kinney and this is my 150th video while on financial math for actuarial exam 2. In this video I want to take a look at a problem from an old sample exam, 2017 SOA, Society of Actuaries, exercise number 68. It's pointed out to me by one of my YouTube viewers and I thought it was a kind of a cool problem that involves well, you can approach it in a couple of different ways, one of which does include using the formula that I derived in the last video, number 149. I'll put a link to it here. But you can solve the problem without that formula. It is kind of a tricky problem, but it's, it's cool because of that. If you really understand concepts well, you can, you can get it. For a bond that is priced at par, and that is important, the goal here is to find the ratio of the Macaulay duration just before a coupon is paid to the Macaulay duration of that bond just after that same coupon is paid. So thanks, first of all. Go out to Xu Yu Feng. I hope I pronounced that okay. On my YouTube channel, who watches a lot of these videos, he asked me about this problem, and um, I went ahead and looked at it and thought it was a really cool problem. So we have a person, Sam, buying an eight-year, 5,000 par bond with annual coupon rate of 5% paid annually. Okay, annual coupons. The bond, here's an important point, the bond sells for 5000 It's selling for the par value, and evidently it's also redeemed at the par value. That's important. That means the coupon rate and the yield rate are the same, and it means the price after any individual coupon is paid is going to be also $5,000. That's, that's important for solving this problem. Let D1 be the Macaulay duration just before the first coupon is paid, and let D2 be the Macaulay duration just after the first coupon is paid. The goal here is to calculate the ratio D1 divided by D2. Okay, so you could stop and think about this for a minute. It may not be real clear what to do, but as is often the case, it is good, I think, to get your mind around things to go ahead and draw a timeline. So that is probably the first thing that most people would do, and I will go ahead and do that. We've got eight years here. And um, you can go ahead and write the coupon amounts if you like. 5% uh, of 5,000 would be 250. So you'll have a payment of 250 here, 250 here, etc. You've got your last coupon pay payment of 250 at time 8, and also the redemption value, which is assumed to be the par value here of 5,000. And uh, then the next thing most people probably might try to do, and I think it is worthwhile to do here, is to go ahead and write down the formula for the Macaulay duration in general. D, you could just call it D or D sub Mac to emphasize it's Macaulay duration. If you like, you can also emphasize that it depends on the yield rate J in general. And I am writing down the general formula here. Uh, in, it's going to be a ratio. In the bottom of the ratio, um, it's going to be the present value of all the payments, so it's going to be a sum. T goes from 1 to n in general, and is going to be 8 in this case, at least if we were doing this at time 0. Um, of all the payments, discounted back to time 0. Like that, kt represents your payment at time t. Oops, this should be a 1 plus j here. 1 plus j to the negative t. Uh, in the numerator, you have something similar, except all those things get multiplied by t. So you'd have a sum, t goes from 1 to n, of t times kt times 1 plus j to the negative t. And I also said, and I derived, uh, that this can also be thought of as a weighted average. t goes from 1 to n of weighted times. That's what the duration is. A duration is an amount of time. So it's kind of like an average length of the bond in this case, of the payments from the bond. Um, so you could write those weights as W sub T times T, where, I think this is all good to review here, where WT would really be uh, the ratio of one of these terms in the sum up here in the numerator divided by the entire denominator. Uh, it might be best to write that as KT, or T times KT times one plus J to the negative T divided by the summation you see in the bottom, but maybe change the index of summation to like m instead of t, just to emphasize um, that when writing this formula here, we're thinking of t as fixed. So um, change it to a different index of summation here. It really doesn't matter, but I'll go ahead and just for conceptual clarity, go ahead and do that. Okay, so that's the formula. So again, it 
these are things that, that as you solve the problem, you might want to write down. Now, if you really get good at solving these problems, you might be able to solve this problem without writing those things down. But I think most people probably want to write those down. Now, now it's important to think clearly here, OK? Um, D1 is the Macaulay duration just before the first coupon is paid. So at time one, uh, right before that coupon of 250 is paid to you, what is the duration? And D2 is the Macaulay duration right after, a second after that coupon is paid. So these, these can be separated in time by essentially an instant of time. Um, so it's the 250 that, that is either there for the D1 but not there for the D2. Okay. However, by thinking about those durations at that time, at the time of the first payment, we are effectively shifting time so that the new time zero is at time one, the new time one is at time two, the new time two is at time three, etc. Like that. And what that's going to mean um, is that the numerator for both D1 and D2, thinking about this formula, the numerator at the top of the fraction is going to be the same because based on the new, new time scale, in both cases, the initial term is going to be t equals zero. Okay, um, in this general formula, you're thinking of t as going from one to n, but it, you know if you are thinking about a the duration of a series of payments, including one at time zero, technically that could be included in the sum. So the numerator is going to be the same, even though in with d1 the 250 would be there, and with d2 it would not be that first uh, payment of 250. Because that first time with this new scale is time zero, the numerator for both of these is going to be the same. It's only the denominator, which is the price of the bond, either right before the coupon is paid or right after it's paid, that changes. So let's go ahead and write that down. D1 divided by D2 is really going to be, since the numerator of both these, these things is the same, those numerators will cancel and we'll just get one over the denominator Denominator in each case, and then we can flip the fractions. It's really going to be the present value uh, with of the series of payments. For D2, that would be without the, that coupon. I'll go ahead and write without coupon payment. Divided by the present value with the coupon payment. That comes from D1, actually. Okay, again, we have to flip the fraction here. So it's the present value with that coupon payment. Now, you actually don't even have to use a formula to figure out these present values. Okay, If you know conceptually that when a bond sells at par and when it's redeemed at par, uh, that means the coupon rate R and the yield rate J are the same. And it also means uh, that the price, the book value, right after any coupon is paid is the same as that par value, 5,000. So the present value without the coupon payment, excluding this 250 here of the remaining things, is going to be 5,000. And the present value here at this time right there, with that coupon payment included for D, that comes from the D1 here, uh, is going to be 5,000 plus 250, because that's the new time zero. That's not going to get discounted at all. 5,250. And this ratio then was, will be the answer for the question. And this is probably the simplest way to solve the problem, but you do have to think carefully about concepts. 5,000 divided by 52.50 is about 0.95238, and that rounds to an answer of about 0.95, which is one of the options on that old sample exam. It's option C. That is the answer to this question. Okay. Now, you see I'm not done with this video. I want to show you an alternative way to solve this. Um, that does involve using the formula that I derived in the last video, video 149. It's an alternative way of thinking about it, and uh, besides emphasizing that formula from the last video, it's going to also allow us to emphasize one more thing here that I think is, is worthwhile to emphasize. So if you're interested in these extra things that I'm about to show you, I think, I think it will be worth your while. So in the last video, I said that when you've got a bond uh, where the coupon rate in this case 5% R, is the same as the yield rate J, would also be 5% because the bond is selling 
at the same as the par value, which again is assumed to be the redemption value when, you, when it's not stated otherwise. Um, I said that the, the duration of the bond, thinking of the bond as annuity um, immediate, thinking about the duration at time zero, in other words, call it D zero, is going to be the same as the uh, present value of an annuity due. Okay, that was a kind of a strange thing from video 149. I can say D zero, the duration of this bond at time, time zero is going to be the same as A um, double dot eight. It's a bond with eight payments here, eight years annual payments here, and the rates are annual as well. That coupon rate, which is the same as the yield rate, is 5%. This quantity is going to be the same as the duration, which is kind of a strange thing. Duration is an amount of time. This is a, a money amount. But numerically speaking, when uh, the bond is selling for the par value and is assumed to be redeemed at par, this is going to be true at time zero. Okay, let's go ahead and calculate this. So let's see, we take 1.05, take its reciprocal, there's V to the eighth power, subtract from one, divide by 0 0.05. And this is a double dot, it's not a, so we need to multiply by one plus j, 1.05. Okay, so d0, the duration, the average length of the bond at relative to time zero is 6.78637334. Okay, um, now I'm gonna write down something that should be fairly intuitive though you might wonder how to prove it. Uh, I will show you how to prove it here in a minute. But D1, the duration relative to time one, right before that first coupon is paid, if you think about it, since these, relative to this new time scale, we're just shifting down by one, uh, it should be the same as D0 minus one. And that is true. So this will be 5.78637334. I'll show you how to verify that try it, try it algebraically here in a minute, but that should make some sense. It's the same series of payments, but now we're thinking about it one year in the future, so all the times get shifted down by one. So I could take that old duration and subtract one from, from it and get this. And uh, D2, since we're finding duration right after that coupon is paid relative to what's remaining, that's also going to be an annuity due value except with seven payments instead of eight. Let's see what this turns out to be. Let me store this value here. Store it in one. Okay, what about D2? 1.05, reciprocal again is V. Now to the seventh power, subtract from one, divide by 0 0.05, and then times 1.05, because it's a double dot. You get about six point zero seven five six nine two zero seven so now d1 divided by d2 hopefully it's the same thing um so i'll take the reciprocal of this multiply by d1 which is in register one and lo and behold we do get the same answer 0 0.95238 about 0 0.95 same answer as we got before, okay? So that's great. That's an alternative way to do it, but to do, use that alternative method, you would have to know this formula involving a double dot, annuity, do, um, which is not something probably most people would have memorized. Um, maybe this one problem makes you feel like it's good enough to put some effort into memorizing that, and it's not super hard to remember, but um, it's not something that I think most people would do. Let's end the video by just verifying that this right here works. Even though it was intuitive, we should probably verify it algebraically, though of course on an exam you wouldn't take the time to do so. You'd be hoping that that intuitive thing is true if you were using this method. Um, D, D0 can be thought of in this case as a sum. T goes from one, let me go ahead and just write eight here because there were eight payments up there of these, think about it in terms of the weighted average. It's going to be simpler that way. Wt times t. Um, yeah, that's going to be Z, d0. And let's see here, d1 
will be really the same sum, except the t's get replaced by t minus ones. Right? It's the same weights. It's the same sequence of payments d ones right before the first coupon, but now the time is shifted down by one, so I have to replace all the times with those times minus one. And then you can distribute the wt through the parentheses, and then using a property of summations, you can write that like this. wt times 1 is just wt, but wait a minute. This summation does equal 1. I mentioned that in the last couple of videos, that when you add the weights, you do get 1. I even talked about verifying it. I think it was in the last video. You could use this formula for the WTs. Imagine adding those up. T goes from 1 to 8, or 1 to n in general. Put the summation here. This summation would be constant with respect to the outer summation. It could be brought out in front as 1 over that summation. And then you could write it as a single fraction where the top summation and the bottom summation are really the same. You might have different indices of summation, T in the top and M in the bottom. But that doesn't matter. The ratio is going to equal 1. The sum of all the WTs does equal 1, and this is d0 here, so we do get d1 is d0 minus 1, okay? So that verifies algebraically what should seem pretty intuitive. Thanks for watching.